Hello and welcome to today's program. We're going to spend some time today with the experts that make up the Global Biorisk Advisory Council, GBAC, a division of ISSA. What we wanna do though is discuss some recent CDC announcements and release guidance involving cleaning and disinfecting. And no doubt you've seen the news and you are concerned about these um, new uh, directives from the CDC. So let's start with you, uh, Paul. Uh, since you have a history with the CDC, in fact, I believe you worked there, uh, what is new with the CDC recommendations? And a part two to this question would be, is there reason for concern for the cleaning industry? Thanks, Jeff. Great questions. So yes, I did have uh, experience with the CDC. Uh, I was a director of their safety organization and spent 10 years at, at CDC. And I know a number of the people that have been engaged in this process fairly well. What's really happened is that they're taking a step back and, and recreating or re analyzing the risk assessment and trying to balance the need or the desire for additional cleaning and disinfection versus the risk posed by the coronavirus in populated areas. And I think there was a, a, an issue in the public statement made by the director. And I think part of it is the fact that it's a relatively new director and she was talking, I think in a fairly personal sense, more talking about it in terms of a home rather than looking at it in terms of public facilities. And so when she was talking about using more soap and water rather than using chemical disinfectants, I think that there was a, mis a, a, a bit of a slip up, uh, that bit of a disconnect, that she was thinking about the people in their, in their own homes rather than looking at commercial spaces. And I, because I think those messages, if you look at the website, are actually still pretty good that they're talking about in, in industrial spaces, focusing on those high touch point areas and making sure you have a plan that's risk-based. And that really hasn't changed significantly. Um, I think the, the, the home was a little unfortunate, um, but I, I, I think that the, the, the balance of it wasn't bad. We're reducing the restrictions on people. And let's be honest, when you have 38,000 people at a baseball stadium, disinfecting the seats is really the last thing you really should be worrying about. It's the person next to you not wearing a mask or not social distancing. By the time you get down to the risk posed by not disinfecting a seat, you are way down in the risk threshold, way, way too low. Patty or Michael, you have a, a thought on that? A thought on that? Michael, um, do you have any? In, in Michael, sure. um, Michael Diamond is here with us today and I'm very excited to have him from Infection Control Tips. Um, so Michael? Yeah, hi. I'm, uh, Michael Diamond, the executive director of the Infection Prevention Strategy. Um, so, I mean, when we, we, we look at the levels of risk and, and like Paul mentioned, I mean, we, we, first off, we need to focus on the primary route of transmission, uh, which is an airborne uh, virus. But I mean, we need to really respect the fact that surfaces matter. Surfaces are a critical part of uh, uh, the overall uh, can, contamination um, environment there. And in order to properly uh, maintain a low contamination level of any environment, we're gonna have to like do a two-step process and we can't skip anything in these processes. First, we need to clean as the CDC mentioned, but then we also have to disinfect. And disinfecting today, um, there's hundreds of chemicals and processes out there that are responsible. Like we would call them responsible uh, chemistry choices. And if they're applied properly and with applicators, which are probably the most successful applicator that exists today is an electrostatic sprayer. Um, I mean, then we're gonna get full coverage and the chemistry be applied properly at the proper parts per million. And if all these things are done, these are safe and they're effective. And you can't skip the disinfection process, nor can you skip the cleaning process to lower contamination levels overall. And I think that's, I know we normally argue with our, <laughs> Uh, groups and organizations saying, you know, you can't skip cleaning. You can't just jump to disinfecting. In this case, you can't just clean and not do disinfecting. And I, I think there's responsible chemistry choices that allow us to do safe disinfection. Do you all think that perhaps there was an overreaction to the CDC announcements by the media? Uh, I'm glad you clarified by the media. Um, you know, yeah, I think that there was. I mean, you know, they're looking for things to be able to talk about. And um, when you looked at some of the announcements, um, it was, you know, you can throw out your disinfectant and that. And that's just, that's, it's irresponsible. And when you think about it, I mean, what Paul and what Michael has, has talked about here, 
is it comes down to doing a risk assessment. And I realize that that for a lot of people is a scary thought, you know, and it's really, we know what the hazard is here. The hazard is the coronavirus, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, during flu season, it's gonna be flu. Um, you know, if you have wrestling mats, it could be staff. Um, you know, and there could be other things, norovirus, um, C. diff in a hospital system. You do your risk assessment and you identify what the hazard is and then look at what your risks are. You know, if you're not going into a situation, you know, and we'll talk about the home. If no one's coming into your home, you are sequestering yourself. You're not going out. You know, the risk of being, of contaminating your home is extremely low if it almost non-existent. So the statements that the director made make sense. But when you equate that out into the public, and even when people say suspect patient, well, how in the heck are you going to know if somebody is a suspect? And, you know, I mean, and that's where you need to do that risk assessment and look at what's the probability of, of coming in contact, for instance, with someone who has COVID-19, the flu or anything else. With that said, what Michael said is, is so critically important, and that is, is that there are some responsible chemistries out there that we know, um, whether it's here in the United States on the end list or internationally, there are really unique chemistries that are out there that are, and we're seeing more and more every day, new solutions and new technology. And the cool part about the new technology and, and from what we've seen is those electrostatic sprayers and some of the other devices that we're seeing, they really help with being able to do that disinfection step in a much more effective, efficient manner, using less chemistry, less time and resources, and having a broader coverage, meaning that, for example, with an electrostatic sprayer, it breaks up this, the solution, the aqueous solution into teeny tiny little particles, and puts an electrostatic charge on it so that when it goes out, it, sp it spreads on the surfaces and surrounds surfaces so much better. With that said, there was a statement made by, our, by the director where she said, you know, there are other hazards. And like with any tool, um, you know, a table saw, um, when you are just learning how to use it, if you don't understand how to use it, you know, then yes, there are some inherent risks that you need to be, uh, be aware of. If you don't know how to use it and use the application, you may not be using it in an appropriate way. So those that training aspect in here is very important to remember if you're an employer and, and if you're an employee and needing to use that. That's a perfect point. When you're looking at things like the electrostatic, electrostatic sprayers and the risk, it's really, it really goes back to training. And the idea that untrained people, non-professionals, people like that are not ISSA members that are picking up these pieces of equipment and indiscriminately spraying, they're, they're a risk. But those professionals who have been trained, you're right, the ability to use fewer chemicals, less material, apply it appropriately, apply it when it's needed, where it's needed is huge. And I think that was missed the, the new that nuance was missed in the the director's statements. Michael, you had a, a point that you wanted to add to this. Yeah, I was. I mean, I was going to say that now is not the time to be letting our defenses down. Uh, if if we if we're paying attention to what's going on around the world, there are new variants that are now surpassing everything we understood to be COVID nineteen. We have a situation that's spiraling out of control in multiple countries. I, you know, we we should be moving ahead with knowing that we have successful programs in place for cleaning and disinfection and for masking and stuff, not abandoning them. You know, the United States is uh, doing very well with their vaccine rollout. Other countries aren't. I'm in Canada. We are struggling. Uh, India is reporting 120,000 plus cases a day and it's going out of control. We all know Brazil's having issues. You know, France is, is, is locked down. I, Ontario, where I'm from, is now locked down for four weeks. I mean, so we have a crisis going on. The last thing we should be doing is abandoning these effective methods of disinfecting that we've already tried and tested and developed and, and just assuming that cleaning will be sufficient. Like I said earlier, we need to focus on a two-step process. The cleaning is to remove the soil and prepare for disinfection using responsible chemistry choices. Yeah, I guess, you know, and to, to bring it all together is that we really, there's a couple things. One, 
Um, we do know that we need to develop better validation processes. And, and there are so many companies out there right now that are doing that. Um, you know, um, I've worked with Paul for many, many years and on the biosafety side of things, that validation aspect has been one of the gaps that we've seen in the, in the biosafety infection control um, world. And we're seeing so much new technology. But what Michael said is so important, that message needs to get across. We have to have a comprehensive way to be able to come after this um, pandemic and any pandemic that we might have or outbreak in the future. And WHO, I think, you know, they had made a comment of, you know, yes, we understand that the most li likelihood of being infected is by airborne, but we cannot look at and get rid of any of the other mitigation strategies, wearing a mask, washing our hands, not touching our face, and cleaning and disinfection of surfaces, because we do know that you can become infected by touching a surface that had recently been sneezed on, say, or coughed on, and touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. And so that is so very important to remember that we need to have a comprehensive program and training. Um, it, you know, it's a lot more than I think a lot of people had realized um, when we first came into this pandemic. So, so you would agree that um, cleaning, disinfecting, the practices we've been talking about and you've been training others still apply? Absolutely. So Paul, let's uh, wrap up with you. Uh, the CDC guidance, what does that mean, guidance? Does that mean law? No. What does it mean? Absolutely not. It is the best understanding by those at CDC and their discussions with U.S. experts in the field. It is not law. It is not regulatory. And it is specific to the United States. So as Michael pointed out, the infection rate in a number of other countries is going off the charts. And to adopt CDC guidance internationally without doing that risk assessment is inappropriate. And so that's really where we've gotta be looking at this. That new guidance from them is part of a large continuum of, of practices. Social distancing, wearing the masks, doing the cleaning, appropriate cleaning at the appropriate location. At home where you're isolated, as Patty pointed out, may not need large amounts of disinfectant. Public spaces, high touch areas where people are social distancing and masking, absolutely needed. So this is not about a directive to stop disinfecting. This is about doing the adequate risk assessment in the United States because of where we are with the high vaccination rates and with the changes in, in meeting in public and social distancing. So it's a relatively unique set of situations. 